not originally from the Gospels, but definitely the good news, which is what Gospel means, for the church today. All right. <coughs> Pardon. I'm going to do my best to keep it together, folks, because uh, the following subject is one that I am very passionate about and uh, uh, sometimes uh, makes me a little emotional. But let me start by saying this. So I was in college when I learned about the inequity of higher education. Now, don't let your minds race or run away with that. Let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean is, is that for many complex reasons, who you are and where you were born has a major impact on what opportunities will be extended to you in higher education. Now, back in 2008, when I was in college, um, now, keep in mind this demographic, this, or I should say this data point that I'm going to offer to you is very outdated, but there's a reason I'm sharing it. In those days, in 2008, I learned that only one in ten of U.S. Hispanics would ever graduate from college. Now, let me start by saying this is not necessarily a bad thing. You don't need to go to college to be successful. It's just one measure of potential financial opportunity. By the way, I have had plenty of successful friends and family members who never set foot in a college. They took up trades, you know, electrical work, auto repair, plumbing, landscaping, cleaning, painting, construction, farming, etc. And they did very well for themselves and their families. Some even passed down family businesses, never having worked for someone else apart from a family member. No, what struck me the most was something that had troubled me since my mom started attending seminary to pursue her calling to be an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. Now, at that time, there was something like 11 million Methodists in this country alone, and more than 90% were white. My mom knew this. She wasn't interested in starting Spanish-only churches. See, my mom came to this country with only Spanish, but she insisted on learning English. And she didn't want to be appointed to Spanish-only churches. That was not the calling she felt God had placed on her heart, no. She wanted to submit to our system of what's called itinerant preaching. That means offering oneself up for appointment as a pastor to churches in a connectional system. So connectional. Does anyone here know what that means? How it relates to United Methodist Church? Anyone at all? Connectionalism. Have you ever heard that word before? Okay. It doesn't surprise me. It doesn't. So buckle up because I'm going to offer you a vision of what it means for the world when a variety of worshiping faith communities decide to unite despite their differences. Okay, so back to my mom. She knew that when the Episcopal leader of our annual conference told her to report to fill-in-the-blank UMC to serve as their new pastor, chances were that most of them would be of a different race than she and that, frankly, she might not experience a welcome for obvious reasons, and frankly also because she had a very heavy Mexican accent. Now, she did her best, of course, but let me tell you two things that really helped her to navigate this very different world was her preaching. She was an outstanding preacher in English and Spanish, and she had this interesting ability to help people to dream big dreams, but also to help them believe in those dreams. I mean, we can get into some real pie-in-the-sky thinking, of course, but we kind of put it in its place. We don't really consider it seriously. She could take concepts like that and make people believe in them. It was crazy. But, no, that thing that was troubling me that I mentioned was that I was feeling called to be a pastor, and it wasn't the call that bothered me. It was the fact that if I was going to get ordained... I would be joining a very lonely group of people. I'll explain. 
You see, if only one in 10 Hispanics ever graduated from college, well, how many of those people were actually considering a religious occupation, like being a pastor? How many of them would be going to seminary? I'm not just talking Methodists here, I'm talking about in general. How many of them were United Methodists? I hope you see where I'm going here. You see, I knew plenty of Hispanic pastors growing up, but almost none of them were appointed to English-speaking congregations for a very simple reason. They didn't speak English. They only spoke Spanish. So I did some digging, and I uncovered an incredible data point. In our denomination, in those days, I should say, um, let me go back. In those days, we used to classify people. This would be like the mid-'80s to like mid-'90s, even up to 2000. We used to classify people according to big-picture racial identities. So Asian, Caucasian, Black, and Hispanic, right? We just kind of sorted people into those big groups. And those were classifications that were just typical of the census of the time. And I learned that of all ordained pastors in the United Methodist Church, Hispanics were the most underrepresented group by a huge margin. We're not even talking one percentage point. I knew five in my youth who were ordained. That included my mom. Out of hundreds in my annual conference alone of pastors, ordained pastors. Now, as to the why of why I'm sharing these details with you, I was gobsmacked, not at the rarity of people like me pastoring UMC churches, not just in this country, but the world over, because we're a global faith. No, I was gobsmacked that all over this world, and this is where I start to get a little emotional, People were putting money into these golden plates, or wooden boxes, right? Which was being put together to provide people like myself with a scholarship to attend college. Somebody thought to do that. Even more so for people like me to attend seminary because you got to go to college before you can go to seminary. That's a requirement in our ordination system. And if it had not been for the faith of good Methodists like yourselves, entrusting a portion of your contributions to our global church, to our connectional system, I might never have had the money for college or for seminary. Someone like me might never have stood here, right here, where I am, delivering this message to you, so far from what I used to call my home. So I thank you so very much for your faithfulness. You see, I owe my life to the good intentions of people just like you, most of whom I will never meet, but have pledged my life to serve. Many non-UMC churches are what we might call congregational. So churches like that, for example, if you go down Warren Road, uh, there's um, a Baptist church. Uh, a little, it's like a little small. It's on the uh, right-hand side, excuse me. Um, there's a Baptist church there. They're, they're a congregational church, like Baptists are. Churches like that do ministry within their parishes, so like everything happens here, right here, in the church. Um, they fund their missions. They hire their preachers. They ensure the upkeep of all of this stuff, all the physical plant. And they do occasionally collaborate uh, with other churches or organizations, but for the most part, they decide how member contributions are used. And so it's natural then to feel, if you're a member of a church like that, to feel a sense of ownership of the church. 
your contributions might even feel a bit more like an investment into the church, more so than like a free will offering, because you know that the future of that organization depends on your contributions. And those churches have their own core values. You go on their website, they have all kinds of materials about what we believe, right? Ultimately, it is the congregation, that congregation, that decides how the church will operate. Now, there's nothing wrong with a system like that. Not at all. In fact, most U.S. churches function exactly in that way. But I could never be a pastor to a congregational church. Because you see, when I read the Bible, I take what I read there as the truth. Now granted, my read might differ from someone else's. The Bible, it needs to be interpreted. Everyone reads it differently. But when I read Paul talking about the body of Christ, that all the members of the body, no matter how big or small, irrespective of their functions, all are part of the body, the body of Christ. And no one can ever take that away from them. And I love that. Moreover, God honors the seemingly lower parts, gives them greater honor than those that, according to our reading from 1 Corinthians, didn't really have a need of it. And God is content to do this because God understands that every member has a contribution to make. And to deny that contribution, which God made, is to rob the body of something integral to what it is. All have something to contribute. Now, you read in Acts that Uh, There were early practices of the church, what eventually came to be called Christianity. It was called the way in those days. And so what did they do? They gathered, they pondered the teachings of God's messengers, the apostles. They ate together. Oh, we're big on food, right? Like, you can't have church and not have food. And when some members seemed to be struggling, the whole group worked together to gird them up, uplift them. They would even, if the concern was financial, they would even sell their property to help those struggling with finances. They did this because they wanted to live into the promise that Jesus shared, the promise of the kingdom of God, what it would look like for God's reign to be the reign of this earth. And word got out, you know, because, yeah, it would, They seem to be doing very well for themselves. And frankly, it seemed so foreign a practice to what most people were doing or how they were taught to treat others. In the kingdom of God, for example, no one begs because all have what they need and those with the most have the most to give so all can thrive. And what a beautiful vision of the world that is. Now, Methodism's founder, John Wesley, began to understand the need for an organized system of communication and accountability as his movement grew. And as I've said a couple of times now, he wasn't really trying to create a new denomination. That was not his task. He was trying to facilitate the Methodist mission of spreading what he called scriptural holiness. He called this system the connection spelled C-O-N-N-E-X-I-O-N, connection. It was a network of classes, societies, and eventually grew to become what we now call annual conferences. So annual regarding the frequency of their meeting, and conferences with regard to how these classes and societies in a certain area would come together to see what they could do together to help an area when they all work together. And it's this unity that lends Methodism its strength. But let me tell you, folks, it is fraught with conflict. It would be unimaginably naive to expect groups from entirely different backgrounds and contexts to be able to work well together. 
I mean, just like society, Methodists encompassed a variety of socioeconomic contexts. There were also differences in education, faith, gender, race, just to name a few. But just as scripture makes clear, those things that should divide us can in fact become strength upon strength when we keep the mission clear and at the fore, when we keep first things first. Our differences cease to be divisive. They become the fuel for a fire that has survived so many schisms. Our church, what we now call the United Methodist Church, has broken apart hundreds of times for many reasons. The history of Methodism is rife with divisions that were simply too deep to heal in their time. And many of them just lined up with whatever was happening in the world at that time. When this country was embroiled in civil war, Methodists separated because of the issue of slave ownership. They became two, later three distinct bodies before they returned together again after many decades. Language and cultural uh, differences had to be addressed before the predecessor strands of what we now call the United Methodist Church had to be negotiated. Right here in Baltimore, if you were a member of a German-speaking Methodist Church, well, when World War II rolled around, that was problematic for a lot of people. And when our denomination was finally stitched together in 1968, hey, let me tell you, those differences did not disappear because they're part of who we are. They, in fact, became fodder for many of the conflicts that we are experiencing to this day, despite some attempting to make the whole thing about one or two political issues. Within the connectional structure of the United Methodist Church, Conferences are the primary groupings of people and churches as they discern and make decisions about what they're going to do in a given region. So Epworth, this church, belongs to the Baltimore-Washington Annual Conference, and its Episcopal leader, the bishop, the one who sent me, is Bishop Latrell Miller Easterling. And our annual conference is divided into eight districts, we're part of the Baltimore Suburban District. We have a district superintendent. Her name is Reverend Dr. Anne LaPrad. Some of you have met her, probably. In October, we'll meet with a few other churches to conduct our annual business as something called a church conference, which is open to everyone. We consider things like, how much is the pastor going to get paid? How's the church doing? We nominate leaders and we attend to many other important tasks. But did you know that as an annual conference, we're part of a global body? We are but one of 54 in the US, 75 in Africa, Europe, and the Philippines. Every quadrennium, delegates representing annual conferences gather as a global body called the General Conference. It just met in May, by the way, the most recent one. And it is the only body that can speak for and make law for the United Methodist Church, how we're governed. In fact, you might have heard on the news that some controversial, uh, controversial changes were made to our system of governance, some of which had to do with our stance on the issue of homosexuality. It led to a lot of hurt feelings. Many churches actually left the United Methodist Church. Now, as I mentioned before, a portion of our offerings are combined through our connection to fund missions the world over. It maximizes our impact in a way that no one church could ever do. So we sponsor missionaries. Uh, we have crisis intervention services. If you ever heard of UMCOR, the United Methodist Commission on Relief, they're sent into disaster areas. We provide oversight and leadership of churches in countries all over the world. We provide higher education to people and places that may have never even had a school in operation. We extend medical care, address critical infrastructure. This is how we fulfill the biblical mandate to give more abundant honor to the parts that lack it. Now, I've made it my personal mission 
to show congregations, specifically the ones that I'm appointed to as a pastor, the joy that they are helping to spread throughout the world for people they will never meet. You could have never known my story unless I had had the opportunity to share it with you today. But your contributions got me here. And that is why I will always be a United Methodist. I will always fight to ensure that the congregations under my care receive the very best of me. Not because they deserve it, but because faith should be rewarded and because I know that I would have nothing if not for the faith of good people like yourselves. Now, if you ever wish to know more about the connection, please don't hesitate to talk to me about it. I've tried to give you a very broad strokes idea, but let me tell you, there is a lot to learn about our connection. And I thought the best way to do it would be to share its impact on my life. Again, thank you, and may God bless you, and may the Lord of unity continue to use us to be a blessing to our world. Amen.